So I'd say welcome to everybody uh, today to our presentation from Reza. Uh, before we start, uh, Barack, can I ask you please to uh, mute everybody? Surely, I'm Thank doing you. it right now. Yep. Okay, thank you, Barack. Uh, so welcome everybody to today's presentation from uh, Reza. Um, as, we, as you know, we have muted everybody on the microphones, so we please ask you to keep your microphones muted. If you have any questions, uh, please send the questions to us using the chat facility. And just to remind you that we are recording this meeting we will take some screen snapshots as well and we will then use that to uh, produce a video which will go on to the FIAB YouTube channel in a number of weeks time. Before we uh, introduce our special guest, uh, let me first of all ask Ricardo Busi, our president, he has a few words of welcome for everybody. Thanks Paul. So dear photographer friends, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you for your participation in this very special edition of the FIAF Photo Academy. As announced last time, we have the great pleasure to have with us today one of the biggest names in world photography, an author who not even needed to be introduced from the moment that uh, is one of the most widely famous philanthropist, idealist, humanist, and photographer worldwide, Reza. I give the pleasure of introducing such a famous guest to my friend Paul Stanley. From my side, I, from my side, I can only say that I'm really very happy that we were finally able to have him with us today in our meeting. Not only because he is a dear friend of mine and a very special person. Well, but also because he was one of the first great masters accepted to be one of our important testimonials in the Waste Home Charity Photo Contest. A contest organized, as you probably remember, by FIAP last year during one of the most difficult moments of the pandemic. But uh, knowing Reza, I can assure you that this was entirely expected as he is a person always ready to lend a hand whenever possible. Thank you, Reza, on my own behalf, on behalf of the entire board of directors of the International Federation of the Graphic Art, and on behalf of the 150 people, friends, coming from more than 30 different countries, over five continents, who have decided to take part in our FIAP event today. I wish you, dear friend, a great success for your presentation. But before handing the floor to the director of the Fiat Photo Academy online events, Paul Stanley, who will introduce our special guest in more detail, I would like to especially thank for his presence, Manifier Delgatti, Reza's brother, who is uh, with us today. He was one of our first Photo Academy guests and also contributed as a testimonial to our charity We Stay Home project. My warmest welcome to him as well. So please, Paul, the floor is for you. Enjoy your event and see you later. Hey, thanks, Ricardo. So today, um, everybody, you are more than welcome. And it is my great pleasure to introduce to you our special guest who will be uh, sharing his life and his photography with us. This is Reza, a philanthropist, an idealist, and a humanist. And Reza um, is a photojournalist, a world-known photojournalist, who for the last three decades has worked all over the world, notably for National Geographic. His assignments have taken them to over 100 countries as a witness to humanity's conflicts and catastrophes. Along with his work as a photographer, Reza is also a volunteer committed to the training of young people from conflict-ridden societies in the language of images. And this is to help them strive for a better world. 
In 2001, he founded Aina World in Afghanistan, which trains people in information and communications through the development of educational tools and adaptive media. He's the author of over 130 books. He's the recipient of many awards. Uh, he has exhibited his work uh, in many different places, notably uh, the exhibition Memories of Exile at the Louvre Carousel, also in the Luxembourg Gardens in Paris with Crossing Destinies, in Washington, D.C. with One World, One Tribe, and in many other places, Doha, Corsica, and so on and so on. And during his presentation, he's going to give us an overview of his work and his actions in different regions, including in Afghanistan. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we say a very, very big welcome to Reza. And uh, hopefully he will now be able to share his, sorry, I'm going to share the screen and hopefully he'll be able to tell me when to move on to the next slide. So Reza, I'll hand the microphone to you. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo, Paul, and everybody that uh, joining me, uh, joining us, actually. I see this more of a tribal gathering uh, than just one person talking to everybody. I'm so glad. As you know, uh, each tribe need this kind of the event and gathering. And uh, we were doing this in the festivals and the jury and ever. Now we are doing on Zoom, but it's very important to to see each other, to get to know. Uh, so thank you very much, Paul, for explaining a little of my biography. As you know, uh, and I'm sure that all of you, you have, I always say to photographer that have a logo, make your no name a logo and make your name as short as possible. If your name is long, forget about it. Get some artists, or whatever uh, artist name for you. It's so it's much easier for the people to, to get to know. That's why I, I start with this. Next, please. So everything I'm doing with the photography, it's exactly in this one page. Power of photography for humanity. We all know that the photography is probably probably the one of the most powerful tool that humanity ever had to connect people, to change the mind, to create uh, connections. So this is the works of the photography, power of the photography. Then it's to us where we use it, I use for humanity. Some use for other purpose, some use in the commercial way. But my, all my concentration always was how photography could help humanity. Next, please. And that's all started uh, when I was 13 years old in Tabriz, in Azerbaijan, Iranian Azerbaijan. Uh, for some reason, I was looking for some things that I could express myself to the people. And at the age of 13, I find that photography could be. This means that it was 56 years ago. I'm 69 minus 13. So 56 years ago, without any possibility of learning or no YouTube for <laughs> learnings in, in, in a, a provincial city of Iran, Tabriz, I started by myself. Uh, learning photography, which was very difficult, but always my goal was I want to use it not only for the art of the photography. Obviously, art is everywhere in, in all kind of the, our art works. But my main goal was I could create a connection that I could show to the people the thing which I see and they don't see. Then I became an architect in Iran because photography at those years, 40, 40, 50 years ago, was not considered as a profession. Uh, there was only three, four studio 
in Tabriz at the time that they were taking the pictures of the for wedding or whatever. So I became an architect. And long story short, when the revolution started, uh, I said, okay, Reza, this is the moment that a lot of things happening in the street. And so why you don't go out and take pictures? So I resigned from my office as an architect in 79, uh, just with, without knowing what I'm going to do. And when I was in the Tehran street photographing, just photographing the demonstration, then I met like Mac, David, Don McCollin, Mark Ribo, uh, Abbas Attar, uh, Michel Setboon, I mean, Olivier Robot, David Bernard, uh, Gilles Perez. I mean, these are the all photographers that were coming to cover revolution. And that's how I saw, I learned, uh, and I became then um, photographer for Newsweek. Like three weeks after I resigned from architectures, I got a, a Newsweek uh, co contract. But from those years till now, that's what I'm going to explain to you a little more. Please, next. So that's the what I think are, um, let's say, our civilization now is going through. We are in the <clears throat> very beginning of a new language, which is the language of image. We had it 4,500 years ago as a hieroglyph. And now the image, as you see, it's coming back. We are, we are communicating with image. We are talking to each other from image. So the, the whole world need one universal language. And this universal language is image, which photography is important part of it. And this for me, it shows that there was a, 4,500 years after, we are now in the beginning of another era. That's why the photography is important. And everything I'm doing, everything I have done is based on this connection of the images. Next, please. It's true that I spend uh, in the 40 years of the photography uh, more time in the war zone or in the conflict zone or with refugees, or with the, in the very people living in a very uh, traditional, the tragic conditions than in Paris or Europe or other. Uh, what I find out that uh, all the wars and conflict, the children and the women are the main victims of the all the wars, all the conflict, all the revolution, the children and the women are the most uh, vulnerable and victims of those. So I concentrated more telling the story through them, but somehow I never um, thought of me as a war photographer. Uh, I would say I'm more of a peace correspondent than a war photographer. <laughs> because I, I want to uh, use this medium, uh, photography, to show that who are the victims and uh, uh, why the war is not human. Uh, but even if I, in, in the war zone, I have to photograph the, the dead bodies, the wounded people, all, you know, the tragic scenes, but usually I don't show them in my photograph. I take them because I see that it's important to have them as a document because I'm there. But what's happening in the war, when I arrived in an explosion scene, uh, I see that the eyes of the survivors has much more emotion than the people that have died on the on the ground. So that's how I concentrate more on the survivor, more on the people that has been through the war, like this little girl that I photographed in the South Afghanistan. She has been over almost four or five years. She's maybe five years old or six. 
and probably five years she was in a war zone. Her village was bombed more than everybody, all, all other villages in Afghanistan. And I think that, and I hope that I'm getting uh, this message to her eyes. Uh, you could watch to her eyes a lot to these pictures, but you could not much uh, watch a lot to a dead body or a, a, a child which has died in a in a war zone. That's the that's why I'm always using this phenomenon of the children and the eyes of the survivors to tell the stories. Next, please. And obviously, uh, these are some of my my first works in Afghanistan. Um, Afghanistan is probably the country which I spent more times in the past 40 years. Uh, and I did a lot of works as a photographer. Uh, for one year, I was UN director on the field to bring the help to the Afghans. And then I created this NGO. So uh, I spend a lot of time in Afghanistan. Uh, next, please. I always wanted that uh, when we say the storytelling, uh, pictures could tell the story, how put the elements to bring this story together. So for example, uh, this picture is one of the first pictures of the Afghan Mujahideen in the 80s when the Russian or Soviet Union has invaded uh, Afghanistan. Usually in the media in Europe, uh, we were calling them uh, shadow uh, fighters, shadowy fighters. Uh, so that's how, when I saw these pictures, uh, I thought that this could explain, this could tell the story of who they are. And obviously there are the guns, everything, all the information that you need to know visually is there. That's how I always work. I, one of the things important for me is purification of the image, not having anything extra on the pictures and everything that in the pictures, it, it should be there because it looks like one word or one phrase that you write a story. You never put a word or phrase which is not necessary in your writings. In the photography is the same thing for me. Each element, uh, each point should be there. Next, please. So working in Afghanistan, you had to go to Pakistan and then find a group of the Mujahideen that they were going inside on foot on the mountains. And this was the 80s, was no phone, no satellite. So whilst you were with them, you'll be there. Uh, sometimes I was there three months without having any news of the outside and nobody knew where I was. And it was a film, so we had to carry all the films with us also, which was a heavy and very difficult because sometimes, and I know some photographer lost all their films because you had to cross the rivers, you have to swim the rivers, you have to go up the mountains of 5,000 meters. It was a really, really difficult time, those 80 years working in Afghanistan. But it's still, when you get in the films, uh, working with the films, probably one shot of the films that we get on the time, now we get a thousand pictures with the digital uh, in the same time, in the same day, probably. Next, please. And obviously, uh, one of the main uh, encounter which I had in Afghanistan, and one of the also reason of the by very trouble there was him, Ahmad Shah Massoud. He was a young civil engineer, the same age than we were the same age. And he has started from the scratch, only one person, the idea that I am going to resist this invasion. I'm not going to let my country to be invaded with the foreigners. Uh, so that's how I met him uh, in 1985. And from this time until he was 
killed, assassinated in uh, 9 September uh, 2001, just two days before 9-11. And assassinating him, it was part of the, also the whole plan. Uh, the, the, the explosion of the World Trade Centers, assassinating him and invading Afghanistan. These were all one old plan, uh, all of them, which come one after each other. Uh, by the way, um, all my pictures, almost maybe one or two uh, that I use some flash, otherwise it's all natural light and not, not much works, obviously no Photoshop and uh, it's just, uh, but, the one that you remember, the Kodachrome 64, mm -hmm. Azar. This yeah. was it. Next, please. Now, I don't know if you recognize him. This is his son, uh, Ahmed Masood Kala. So he's 32 years old. Uh, he was graduated from London schools. And uh, I met him a lot because I knew his father. Uh, and uh, now when the Taliban take over, the second time, this couple of months, in August, he is the only Afghan that did exactly what his father does, uh, resisting invasion. Because in reality, Taliban is an invasion of this country by foreigners. They were helped by foreign countries. They were giving a lot of uh, possibility of takeover of Afghanistan, and especially in this very, very barbarian way that they do. You have seen uh, some of the uh, this barbarian action that they do. Uh, so Ahmad Masood is the only between all the other Afghans that they decided either to exile and have their uh, lives or, uh, or the other like Ashraf Ghani that uh, uh, who was a real disaster. He is, you know, there's a lot of rumors about the how many money he got and uh, he gave the Afghanistan to Taliban. Uh, anyway, so Ahmed Masood, uh, he is the only one that continue resisting. And I spent a lot of time with him also uh, a couple of years ago uh, and recently in Paris also he came. Uh, so the hope for a better Afghanistan and if there's better Afghanistan, it's meaning better region and it's meaning better region, it's meaning better world. That's why Afghanistan has played an important role uh, from the time of Alexander the Great till now, and is still playing. Uh, probably you never thought that uh, the reason, one of the reasons of the Berlin Wall falling uh, was the defeat of the Soviet army in Afghanistan. Uh, so Ahmad Shah Massoud for me is one of the important person who push the Berlin Wall to come down and dismantling of the Soviet Union was the reason. Well, this is the historian works. Next, please. The, uh, this is the Panjshir Valley. Uh, Panjshir Valley is where Ahmad Shah Massoud was, when is Ahmad Massoud is, and where the resistance is. This is also very historical point because the Soviet army which has never been defeated, was defeated here exactly in the same point that you see this, the, the dust which is coming up. This is where the Soviet military were defeated by Ahmad Shah Massoud, the father, seven times. They came seven times and all the seven times they were defeated. And that's the, I said the defeat was that brought the Soviet Union down. So, when you're doing this kind of reportage, you have to go the portrait, but also landscape. So it's a very, very vast, uh, let's say, part of the photography that I do. Uh, not only because people say, oh, it's different uh, portrait, uh, uh, landscape, uh, uh, sport. But when you're doing reportage, like I, I have done for 40 years, when I'm doing the story about the country, I have to do sport, I have to do weddings, I have to do children, portrait, landscapes, industry, economy. So that's how you have to go 
to all of them. Next, please. And as I said, when you walking in the mountain, uh, like I was doing in the same way, uh, a lot of times you met uh, other people that were taking refugees, like this couple that they were taking refugees, uh, leaving their villages after the bombardment and going to another places. Next. Uh, this is a portrait of uh, uh, American special forces uh, that were fighting uh, uh, terrorists in Afghanistan, which they didn't find them. Um, but anyway, this is another story that uh, we should work on it, uh, how and why the US invaded Afghanistan in 2001 and how and why they left uh, a couple of months ago and they left all the weapons and munition in the hand of the Taliban. You may know that the American, they left $85 billion worth of the materials to hand of the Taliban. And you know who Taliban's are. They came to fight. They said that we came here to fight the terrorists. And at the end, they not only they brought a terrorist group in Afghanistan as a governor, but they also give them all the weapon necessary to do whatever they want. So this is another story. Next, please. Now, this is a famous Buzkashi sport in Afghanistan. It's for the home that they don't know. Buzkashi is one of the oldest sport in the region, probably the only one, or very old, where um, it's, imagine a soccer game, but the players are on the horse, like polo, like chogong, but there's no ball. There is a body of a goat that is beheaded the, the, the night. So, and they put it there. So they have to go down and get the body of the goat and bring that to the goal. That's how they call Bozkashi, which in Afghani and in Farsi, it's meaning, um, what is it, the Bozkashi? It's meaning that uh, um, grabbing the, the goat or something like this. Pulling, Next. pulling the goat. Pull, yes. Thank you. Next, please. Well, reportage is also like street photography. You are always outside. You are always going to find stories, find people looking around. And sometimes you find people that you say, well, this is the best I ever had. And you learn a lot. I always learn a lot from the people which I photograph. Like this little boy, he was in a village in Afghanistan that was totally destroyed. Now imagine the whole the village is destroyed by the war, no trees left, nothing left there. And even the, the, there's only two or half of the school that remain and all the children there, half of the village is totally destroyed after the bombardment. And they had this little work in the school that they do and bringing the uh, plants back home. So when I'm taking his pictures, I talk to him, just, just you know, having a little chat. And my chat was after saying that, so you're happy to have this plant with you, I see. What are you going to do with it? He looks to me very proud and he said, oh, and he looks around that was everything was destroyed. Go, I'm going to grow a tree. And this was so touchy, touchy for me. Uh, so uh, every time I have a project now, I start a project, I think about him saying that Reza, whatever you do, think about it like, like a tree, like any project is like growing a tree. So that's how, so I learn a lot. The, my master of the thought are everybody on the street, uh, not only the philosopher or intellectual people, which I saw, I read their books, but sometimes you learn more in this way from the normal people if you go behind the photography, if you are not only there for taking pictures and running. Uh, 
and making hello. Next, please. So um, these are the important words for me, the witness. We are the witness. You are all witness, all the photographers somehow, because everything we do, uh, it is getting the, uh, our daily life or the daily life of the humanity, what's happening in our lives. And I always thought that uh, very, 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 very old, uh, let's say, sign of the uh, photojournalist, what we do is the painter on the caves that we find. I mean, if we, we the photographer now, we were 40, 50,000 years ago, probably we were a painter on the caves. If we were 15,000 years ago, we were making this rock paintings on the Sahara. If we were 5,000 years ago, we were painting, uh, making this design of the Egyptian tombs, the daily life of the Egyptian tomb. So every single moment of the humanity you were people that they were obsessed by putting an image, visualizing the daily life and showing what's around. So before us, they were painters doing this. They were like Gustave Doré is one of the famous one that he was going everywhere. And there a lot of them, the uh, travelers that uh, sketching the painting. And now we are the same group. We are, it is not a new works. It is something that has been there for 50,000 years now, being witnessed. And then, like me, well, I decided to be in the eye of the storm, eye of the cyclone, uh, where the explosion is happening, where the war is going on. Next, please. So covering a, a 80s after new, Newsweek, uh, two years, uh, I became Time Magazine and the life photographer over five years. In the meantime, I was distributing through SIPA Press. SIPA Press probably uh, between the three famous agency, Gamma, Sigma, and SIPA, which I work for the SIPA. Um, I must say that the SIPA, it was between the three, the biggest photo agency in the world, but also it was the first and the best School of the photojournalism uh, because of the director, director Gokshin Sipa Yoglu. <coughs> he was a, himself a photographer, himself he has gone through all those wars and conflict, uh, and he knew how to help us young starting uh, photographer to become, you know, to, to do the works. While the other Gamma and Sigma. The directors and the people, they were mainly the businessmen uh, that became the, or journalists or whoever that became. So SIPA was the best school for me. And I want to salute the Gokshin <coughs> SIPA Yoglu, who passed away a couple of years ago. This is my story on uh, South Africa, my pictures uh, during the riot. Uh, 85 was the turning point in the South Africa, it was impossible to go there for many photographer. At the time I got visa as a elephant hunter. Uh, I went to the embassy in Paris saying that I'm an elephant hunter. Um, now with Google, it's impossible to do this kind of the works. Uh, the Google is the, is, we lost all the possibility of uh, uh, going under different names uh, to take pictures. But anyway, I love these pictures because if you see not only the burning car, it is his back and he has his toy car walking around. But when Nelson Mandela was liberated, nobody knew how Mandela looks. We only had a pictures of him 30 years ago when he was in prison. I thought that, my God, this Mandela looks like, I mean, he looks like a my old Mandela which coming out of the street. I don't know what you think about it, but he really uh, have the same way that walking and face also. 
Uh, so I spent three months uh, covering the whole riots and everything as an elephant hunter in South Africa. Cool. Next please. The, the, another moment that in this photography that touched me all the time and I learned also, it was in Sarajevo. You remember Sarajevo, which is in the heart of the Europe. It was 45 minutes from Italy. Uh, but, and when you were arriving there, uh, I, even going there was dangerous because the Serb has surrounded the Sarajevo and they were shooting uh, everybody. There were snipers everywhere. So it was really, really difficult times in the Sarajevo working there. For four years, the city was besieged like uh, ancient Middle East, Middle Age times. People, they didn't have food. People, they were hungry. Uh, no medicines, nothing. I mean, imagine they, they were making agriculture at their garden, at uh, their home, just to make some potato to, to eat. Uh, um, so one day, well, all the snipers really shooting a lot and uh, nobody was getting out. Only these crazy photographers that we have to go out in any conditions. I saw this little girl standing there, was very astonished to, to see why she's there and what he's doing. And when I asked her why you are here, it's dangerous. And she said, oh, I, I want to sell my dolls. Um, I have home to sell my dolls. I said, to whom? I, uh, she said, I don't know. And I, then I said, but why are you selling your dolls? And she said, I love my grandma. And uh, she ha we, we didn't have food for four days and she's so hungry. So I thought that if I uh, sell my dolls, I could buy food for my grandma. And these are the things that, you know, thinking of our kids grown up in Europe, uh, in other places, and um, think of these kids. So she also became one of my masters of the thinking about always how we have to behave, how we have to take action with the people and whatever around us. Next, please. Another important story, which I covered also over years, was uh, the massacre in Rwanda and Burundi between Hutu and Tutsi. Um, um, you know, in over a few months, 800,000 people were killed and they were killed under the eye of the French and Belgium military that they were there. Uh, so uh, what was important for me that the survivors like them, they, these are the survivor that they had probably uh, lost all the members of the families and they had to cross rivers with crocodile, uh, the, the, the forests with all kinds of the animals, you know, finally to reach a uh, camp of the Medicine Without Border, Medicine Sans Frontières, where I was there. And these guys immediately, they were starting to build what they needed, the little house, little the camp and everything. And for me, this is also what I saw in the war and conflict zone, that the resilience the resilience of the people, the beauty of the life that's strong, how strong is the life? Unbelievable. Next, please. <clears throat> now, I just show a po portrait of one of them. He has seen everything. He has lost all of the families except his granddaughter, Alphonsine, that she was 16 years old but she was raped by an enemy. This is also another thing that usually a lot in the wars happen. And she had a child and she wanted to keep the child while everybody else was saying that you shouldn't keep the enemy's children. And so they, they wanted to attack her and to get the child. And he was sitting 24 hours in front of the door of their little cabana, uh, not to, to let the peoples come. 
He was not talking anymore. He was just watching like this. Next, please. One of the stories also uh, that the covering this Rwanda and Burundi conflicts happened to me. Uh, once uh, in the one of those refugee camps, there were two million refugees that they flee uh, and they were put on a huge tents uh, all around the other countries. Uh, around Rwanda and Burundi. And one of the time, the director of UNICEF at the time said that we are working on a project that we have 12,000 children uh, between all the refugees, that we are all gathered them in one place, one camp, 12,000, because we don't know where are the parents. We don't know if the parents has died. We don't know if they were just separated from the parents while they're walking or running in a difficult condition. So they have started a project which was stopped for some different reason. I didn't know why. They asked me to help them. And the, the project was photographing all those 12,000 children. Next, please. So I, I trained some local refugees and also I brought uh, 600 rolls of films and uh, a few cameras. Uh, so they were able to photograph all this 12,000. Uh, and then they made an exhibition in the camps with next one. So this is probably, probably I should write it in the Guinness Book of the Records, which I didn't. There's 12,000 portrait, this exhibit. So we created exhibition in the, uh, each camp, there was five camps, five copy of the same exhibition, 12,000 portrait, and asking people to come up and uh, to see if they find anybody that they know, maybe the children, maybe the, um, the children of the families or whatever. <clears throat> and, in four months that the exhibition was there, then everything was dismantled, the war came again. But in, in four months, uh, there were 3,500 children that were united by their families, thanks to this project. As I said, it was UNICEF and International Red Cross project. Uh, it was not my initial idea. I just came in when they were they had some difficulties to do the project and they asked me to help them. So that's how the, sometimes, and not only sometimes, always when I see uh, social problems, my first question is, is photography could help to solve this problem? And this is coming from this. I mean, showing that, sorry, that yes, photography, was able to bring 3,500 children to the families. Next, please. Uh, this is one of the moments that one grandmother um, seeing his, her, her uh, grandson. Next, please. Obviously, uh, Feynman is one of the uh, big, I would say, problem of our times. It has been there, but having it still in 21st century or 20th century, it's unacceptable. Uh, how still we could do this? How still we could let the people dying in places in, uh, um, while we are able to, to send uh, uh, satellites, uh, thousands of the satellites all around the, globe or even reaching the march. But when I had to go to these pictures, I had the, it was in 1989, uh, doing with uh, French uh, filmmakers, Frédéric Mitterrand, doing the films and I was doing pictures, we went together. And it was first times I was going there and I had a real problem because usually when I photograph, 
I try to live with the people. I try to be like them. I try to have the same food or stay in the same place than they are. And this was a, a challenge for me, how to do, how I understand it, their suffering. So I do remember before going there, for 72 hours, I didn't eat anything. I made like, a, you know, uh, closing my uh, apartment in Paris, uh, no refrigerator, uh, I mean, closed the refrigerator and only was drinking the tea for three days, for 72 hours, just to understand the suffering of the people which I'm going to photograph. Because many of the pictures which I have seen before, I didn't like them. They were not showing the dignity of these people. They were showing these people as an object on the ground. And this is not the thing which I wanted to do. I want to bring their dignity as a human. So that's why when, when I entered this room that he or she was there, I thought that I'm in front of the Rodan statue of the sinker, the thinker, you know, the statue. And I said, oh my God, look, what is he or she thinking about us? What, what could happen in her mind? What, what should, could she think about it? So that's why I kept this one as the pictures of my works on my portfolio on the famine. Next, please. Now, <clears throat> street photography is very tricky and I love it but also uh, spontaneously is very important. Uh, I must say that I never stage any pictures. I never, uh, the only times that I may ask people to move is when I take their portraits or portrait in general. So for portraits, of course, obviously you need to work with the person, but for the street scene, never, or war zone. Unfortunately, I have seen a lot of photographer who are staging the pictures, who are asking the soldiers to do the movement, who are asking the people to do it again. But I realized that if you can catch the reality, it's much more stronger than any setting that you can do. And, uh, you know, these pictures, uh, I, I have written stories. I write stories about all my pictures. And this is, <clears throat> I take these pictures in Turkey and uh, the background that you see the mountain is Iran. I have been in, uh, I get out of Iran in 1981 because of my photographs. I have been living in exile in uh, over 42 years now. Uh, you know, that's happened when, when you keep your uh, ideas, uh, you will be put in the jail, in prison, in torture. So I had to flee Iran and I haven't been back there. So this is a very historical pictures because what you see in front of the frame, it's almost also have part of Iran in it. And I always thought that uh, as Manuche, my brother is two years younger than me. And why say we are two brother doing the same works actually in different parts of the world that this is symbolic of me and my brother that we are just, what we do, we are showing a little part of the reality in front of us. We just frame uh, what we see. And this that's why I think, I always say that this is looks to be like Manucha and me uh, showing what we do. Next, please. So talking about portrait and uh, normal daily light, that's how I do. That's how, uh, this is an Egyptian, he was a, uh, how you get the captain of a small felucca, a boat which I hired for four days, traveling the, uh, on the Nile, uh, Nile. I was doing a story for National Geographic on Nile Delta. And I took like maybe one or two portraits of him because we were working together. And, uh, but now he's, he's became one of my famous portraits. And almost all the women, they love him. They, every time I show in the place, I see that the reaction of the old women would be, oh my God, do you know him? Where did he live? It's a, this is the one of the portraits. As I said, 
no setting and natural light and boom next uh, photographing the culture and all the ritual is also part of what we do on doing reportage so in 40 years i have been almost in all the rituals of the different religion the, the, the islam uh, christianity judaism uh, hinduism and buddhism and many of them many others in africa it is part of the daily life it's part of the life that's uh and this is uh, uh there is in uh, as a photograph in istanbul uh this was a cover of uh, one of my cover of national geographic uh, this was my second story for national geographic on turkey next please <clears throat> Well, I mean, another thing is, while you are in a country, while you are photographing, you should come with the pictures that people, they understand where you are and you have all the elements. So where could be this one? This is Provence, south of France. Um, again, if you look to this pic painting of the uh, Monet and Monet and uh, other impressionists that they lived in the same places. I was a couple of house far from many of the um, impressionists painted that uh, when I take this picture. So that's how also you got uh, inspired by the place. You got inspired by the uh, story of the place. You got inspired by uh, the mood and the, you, you got some pictures like this one that for me is, this is my Provence. Next, please. Uh, other stories, other landscape, like uh, I was living uh, for three weeks with the nomad tribe, the Kazakh nomad tribes uh, in the north of the northwest of China. This is the uh, place with the China, Russia, and Mongolia. They come together and create this mountain, which is Altai mountain. And I lived there with the Kazakh tribes for three weeks. And this is my pictures I call the full moon lovers. And everybody's always to me said, where's the, where's the horse? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I let you guess where's the horse. It is not inside, obviously. Next, please. OK, well, again, I'm telling that we have to do doing reportage, everything, including landscape. And this is a fantastic place in the Algeria, the desert of Algeria, which is, I mean, you know, this is... Hello, next please. I also love horses. I mean, I traveled a lot, uh, uh, on horse in, in Kurdistan uh, or in Afghanistan. These are the two places which I really uh, traveled a lot on horses. Uh, but, and I'm photographing horses a lot. Uh, but these are very special race of the horses, unique in the world. In, in Turkmenistan, the, the Turkmenistan horse, which is called Akhalteke, they are unique. They are probably the most beautiful horse I have ever seen. So this is part of this, my works on the horses. Next, please. And this is another one. Uh, this is part of a big story on the Amur uh, River, which is border of China and Russia in Siberia. I lived six months there. And in the winter, it became minus 40 degrees. So I have gone to, uh, this is a special tribe that they do hunting in the winter uh, on, on horses. So I went with them. This was a hell of a difficult assignment I ever had. Minus 40 degrees, your batteries was dying in a minute. You didn't have possibility of, the, you know, uh, I mean, hopefully there was not charging. There was, uh, I had to bring a, a huge part of the batteries but it was so cold that my film was cracking inside the camera 
So many of my films in those times, I had to open it and uh, see the films uh, that I have taken all the pictures, the, the small portion of the f falling on the, uh, on the ground. Next, please. Oh, okay. That's, <laughs> that's how you became the going to Martin minus 40 on this horse riding with those uh, Siberian tribes. Next, please. I said that I, I'm doing a lot of works through the children. I was doing a story about the Abraham for National Geographic. The Abraham is the founder. It, first of all, it's a mythical personality. There is no sign, no even a single archaeological sign of him. But all the three religion, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, they are talking of him like he's alive, like he's there. And he's the founding father of all those three religions. Uh, obviously, one of the reasons that there's Judaism and Islam, because he got two wives. And each wife has a son. So the Jewish, they say that we are, we are from one uh, uh, wife, and the Muslims say they are from other wives. So you see, this is very incredible story that at the end, all this fighting and everything between the religion, it's come to one man. He is the founder of all those. And while I was doing the story about Abraham in Jerusalem, I realized that this is the, the, more, the only common name in this three religion we have. The Muslim, they call Ibrahim. The Christian, they call it Abraham. And the Jewish, they call Avram. So I said, oh, why not put storytelling, you know, that you think about it, how to tell the stories. Uh, why not bring the three kids that all of them uh, are different. One is Christian, one Muslim Palestinian, and one Jewish uh, together, that their name is Abraham, and that all of them, like, same age. So I found this, this three, 13 years old boy, all of them the same age. But anyway, it, this is a long story. It takes me eight days to get the permission of all the different groups and the parents and the militaries and militias, eight days I was finally to bring them them to get this one pictures. Next, please. Uh, well, I'm being maybe being a lot in the war zone and uh, being a lot with the soldiers. Most of the soldiers are 20, 25 years old. They are kids when you see them, really their kids uh, just came out of the village. Uh, they were 19 years old, 20 years old. Then I realized that uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, countries almost everywhere that train their kids as a soldier. Uh, so I'm against it. I'm against uh, giving the, the weaponries to the children or making them do, to play as a uh, as a soldier, uh, then I realized that uh, most of the video games that our children are playing with is the war games. Uh, this is terrible. They're killing by pushing a button. Uh, and they, 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 by playing this, they became addicted to, for, to killing. And also the killing to became something normal for them because they push a button. Then when I was covering the recent wars, like the war in Afghanistan, and I was with the special force, the, 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 the soldiers, 20 years, I realized that at the end of the day, when they came back to their camps or the tent, what they do, they open their computer and they put the video war games and they play again the same. But then I realized that something fishy here, uh, Someone told me that uh, many of those video games that we, we give to our children, it is on purpose done by some countries' militaries. So they want the children being educated from the childhood to kill, I mean, to, to play the war first and then became soldier that was playing. It looks like trainings from the childhood. Those video games are very dangerous. Let the, everybody's around you know that 
this is not a game, that this is decided in some high level. Maybe all those war, uh, military uh, groups or the merchant of the uh, weaponries or factories that making the, the, the guns because they need to sell the guns. So they need to have wars. It's very complicated. I mean, these are a lot of things which over 40 years I have worked on it and I need to put all of them one day in a book. Next please. Oh, you see this one, for example. Kids, like child in this age, I don't think that any country uh, should do this, get the children dressed as a military and played as a military for any reason. The, the only war which is I accepted, and I accept it, I say, is when you're defending your home, when you're defending your homeland, when your home is invaded and you are fighting back to take out the invaders out. This is obviously, there's no way not accepting it. But making war for economy, for uh, uh, petrol, the oil, gas, whatever, for uh, this is not acceptable. And unfortunately, I could uh, show on the map that 80% of the recent wars are for petrol. Oi, 80% of the wars. Next, please. You see, these kids, I mean, it should be in the school, but it's in the villages between Afghan and Pakistan border. You have this enormous workshops, hidden, although obviously these are all hidden places. Uh, when you go there, you see these kids making guns. And what I heard that they they do they can do all the guns and everything is perfect. Never never had a problem with the guns that they built there. Next please. When the Islamic State the, or Daesh take over in Iraq and Syria in 2013 and 14, uh, I immediately went there to to be there to be in front line of the fighting them. Because I have seen how the Islamic Republic in Iran, which is a wrong name, actually, this is not a republic, what's the Iran. When you have one guy that decide over it, it's the Khalifa. It's, it's Islamic State. It is not a republic of your Islamic Republic. It is just a, a Khalifa. You have one guy over there, and then the, you have executives. You can call them whatever you want. So I have seen a disaster of these mullahs, of these ayatollahs that they have done to Iran. Uh, Iran has become, uh, um, let's say, uh, the biggest prison in the world, open, open, open uh, air prison in the world. Even while I'm talking to you, they were killing the farmers who were demonstrating peacefully a couple of days ago because the government people, they changed the pipeline uh, uh, of a river, the, the, uh, the water of a river, and the farmers, they didn't have water for years. For, and they were just coming asking, why you take uh, uh, water of the river to another places? And it's happening in Iran all the time. So this mafia that govern Iran, when I see that others, Islamic or or religious state, anyway, it doesn't matter Islam or Judaism or Christianity, the religious people, they shouldn't be involved in the government. If they do, you see the disaster. What, what they have done, the Iranian in Lebanon, they destroyed Lebanon, they destroyed Yemen, they destroyed Iraq, they destroyed Syria. So when the Islamic State came, I just went there, I wanted somehow to put my works uh, to fighting them. And they were the Peshmerga, the Kurdish Peshmerga. They were the bravest ever I have seen. If they were not the, in the 2013-14, the, the, this Kurdish Peshmerga, if they were not there, uh, Daesh or Islamic State 
has been taken almost uh, all the Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, maybe half of the Turkey, and they were in the European gate. They were in the European gate, the Islamic State. The Kurds are the only one, and the only one that they fight them. All the others that they say we fight them, they're lying. They were not there. I was for three years on the ground, photographing them, and that's one of my pictures on the front line. Go ahead, please. So she's one of the uh, refugees that has fled the uh, uh, advance of the Islamic State, Daesh, and came back to the city of Erbil, which is the Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, I must tell you that uh, there are 3.8 million population in Iraqi Kurdistan. When Daesh attacked Iraq and Syria, they opened the doors for the refugees. Do you know how many refugees they got? 1.8 million refugees for a population of 3.8. This is what they do, the Iraqi Kurds, which is called the Kurdistan uh, regime, uh, re regional, sorry, the, the government. <clears throat> uh, they opened the doors and they brought 1.8 million refugees. No other country giving the proportion of their population uh, has got this courage and hospitality of almost bringing 50% of its population. I mean, if it was like France, there should be like 40 million refugees in France. They're accepting. Why? They don't even accept 2,000 or 3,000. And you go on in each country. So that's why I went to spend these three years photographing those uh, the Kurdish people fighting them and having this hospitality for these refugee people. And these are the, probably you heard about the Yazidi girls. Yazidi girls, mm -hmm. Yazidi is a tribe uh, which is living in a Iraqi Kurdistan. And <clears throat> well, they have the most beautiful girls and women in the whole Middle East. I see as a, I'm sending as a, as a photographer also. Uh, Middle East is, you know, you know, where is it? And the Yazidi tribe have the most beautiful women and girls. So the Islamic State people, when they start fighting, they, they take a, a reading from Quran that says that the wife and the uh, children and all the belonging of your enemy is belong to you. This is written in Quran. So if you win the war, you can do whatever you want. So what they did, this Islamic State people, they attacked the Yazidis' villages, houses. These are probably the most disturbing stories which I have ever heard about it. When they were gathering the whole family or everybody in the village, they were making a couple of different pies. One, they were girls, under 30, girls or women, under 30 in one side. Girls and women over 30 in another side. The men in another side. Then what they were doing, they were shooting the, all the women over 30, all the men in front of the other girls that they were between 18 and 30. When they were killing all the families, all the members, then they were taking them hostage and they're bringing them with them uh, using as a sex uh, slave. And after one or two weeks that they were uh, tired of them, they were selling them to each other. I mean, these are the real stories. These are the people with the, the, the Islamic State they were doing. They were doing this slave market, selling those girls after the Friday prayer in the city of the Mosul, they have made a special market. Every Friday after prayer of the Friday, they were coming out, they were bringing those girls and they were selling them. Some for $200, $300. So these are the stories in those three years. 
which also I witnessed. Next, please. I met a lot of those women and girls uh, and the families and the parents uh, over a few months as I was photographing those Yazidi. And they were always talking about a road that when they take this girls and women, 5,000 from different villages, they were talking about a road that was terrible for them, like the, the road to, you know, to, to hell for them. So I decided to go as much as I could on this road to find the signs of what's happened. And when I, <clears throat> I arrived in a place that there were tens of this close like this on the ground, I mean, you know, I photographed them. But I returned back because this was showing the whole story. Next, please. Uh, so these are the, some, the, some of the girls that either they have been kidnapped and then they escaped because some of them, the government, the Kurdish government, they were able to get a fund and send the smugglers to buy them in this market and then smuggling them out. And many of them, they became soldiers. They wanted to fight or they were cousins or sisters that they were not be taken. So they were brave fighters also, very brave fighters. Next. Another pictures of the Kurdish people because Saddam Hussein has killed 18,000 of the Kurds. And one of the main problems of the Kurds in the war is that they divided in four countries uh, after the fall of uh, Ottoman Empire. And each country, they are killing their own Kurds. So they fight back. And so it has become a very, very difficult situation now. Uh, because when you're calling back, you could be called, you could be named a terrorist. When you don't uh, fight back, you will be killed. Like, Saddam Hussein killed 180,000 Kurds. And these are the sum of the graves of them. And she was a young girl when uh, her husband was killed by Saddam and she decided not to marry. Like almost all those women and, that I met that they, they didn't marry anymore. So this was a no rules day, the beginning of the year that uh, all people were coming to the graves and. Uh, she was coming to this grave, mass graves. Next, please. Another big story uh, that now I'm here in Baku, Azerbaijan, and I was covering over 30 years, it's what's happening in between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, from 1992, the first war started. In 1992, it was just two years after the uh, fall of Soviet Union. Azerbaijan had no military. The reason is very simple. During the Soviet time, because the Soviet, they were not using, helping the Muslim countries in Soviet Union, like Azerbaijan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, all these Istans and Tatars, because they were Muslim, they were not, uh, they were always used as a suspicious or second, uh, let's say, um, second degree, and they were never, never teaching them war. They never had a real uh, military, never. While Armenia, that they are Christian, Orthodox Christian, and they were Russian allies over 100, 100 whatever years. They were allies in the many wars for 200 years ago with Iran. They were allies uh, with the Russian when the war with the Ottoman happened. So the Armenia, they have a, in 92, a fantastic, a very up-to-date military. Azerbaijani, they had none. So I came to cover this from Azerbaijani side because the media in Europe and America, uh, they are having much more attention 
in Armenia uh, through the eyes of Armenia to the story than from Azerbaijan and through the eyes of Azerbaijan. That's how I decided, okay, like you have 10 photographers other side, there's none here, I'm going this side. That's what I, I was doing it always in all the wars and conflict. So one night the Armenian soldiers, they besieged a village which is called Khojali. And they just start burning the houses and shooting inside the houses and killing the people. They killed 603 people in the night, children, elders, and all the others they had to flee. It was in the 26th February, 1992. So I arrived in the scene like two, three days after, uh, finding the survivor that they have flee the village because the village has taken out by the Armenian military. And she was one of those survivors that was looking for the body of uh, her son and her husband, because the Red Cross was able to go and bring the bodies, the dead bodies, and the people were standing there to look for it. So this is the moment that she found the body of uh, her uh, son and husband. Next, please. <clears throat> this is another survivors of the Khojali. Uh, it was unbelievable. I, I was in those this spot where all the survivors were for four days, four or five days. I was with a group of the French uh, doctors there uh, and Red Cross. So uh, this man was sitting there. Every time I came there, night, day, every time he was sitting on a stone and uh, he has one word, see, my son. You see, he has cried too much that he didn't even have any more uh, tears coming up of his eyes. And you see, next picture, please. This is what he was holding in his hand always and just saying, where's my son? Where's my son? The only word I had over four days. Next, please. So what's happened after this 1992 as I said, there was no military in Azerbaijan. The Armenian take over the Karabakh, not only Karabakh, which was fighting for this, but also they take like one-fifth of the Azerbaijan. I mean, I don't know how much will be the one-fifth of Italy or one-fifth of France, or if you, in your country, imagine that one of the neighboring militaries, they come in, and they invaded one fifth of your country. But what they did also, immediately they were giving to the people living there like 10 hours to leave with nothing. So in 92, from 92 to 93, they take over all these places. They killed 50,000 people and 1 million people became refugees. 1 million of Azerbaijanis, they were thrown out of their home with nothing in their pockets, nothing. So I was also witnessing those refugees while going back to Europe and uh, reading newspapers and magazines everywhere that was totally different. The, uh, in, in the New uh, European uh, newspapers, magazine and US, uh, the Armenian always shown in the story as victims and Azerbaijani because they are Turkic, you know, being Turk, being Muslims in front of a Christian uh, and uh, ally, you lose in the media. That's how they lost in the media. The, the, um, so for 30 years, the Armenian, they were in this house, in, in this one fifth of Azerbaijan. They had one million people, they were thrown out. All the population was 9 million in this year. So 1 million out of 9 million became refugees or IDPs. And finally, Azerbaijan start, you know, there was a peace process which didn't work. So they start having their own militaries and army and they got help from Turkey, from Israel. Armenian get helps from other countries, uh, from Europe, uh, so 
in last year, the war started and I came here to cover the war. Now, I wanna make this understand to you that the war, it was not in Armenia. The war was inside Azerbaijan. They were fighting to liberate their lands that they were taking by Armenia. So nothing was happening in Armenia. No one bullet was fired to Armenia. No one rocket was fired inside Armenia. While the Armenian in the war from Armenia, they start shooting the missiles inside the population area, not in the war zone. They shot in two cities that were 60 kilometers far, people sleeping at night and rockets came in, boom, 20 people were killed. Then another city, uh, cluster bomb, you know the cluster bomb is forbidden. I was witness, I arrived in the scene three minutes after a cluster bomb hit and the 20 people died. One of the pe person which I photographed was a boy of 16 years old in a village. He has gone to get this pomegranate uh, for her mother. And when the Armenian missile hit the village, his body was destroyed. When I arrived there, this was a horrible scene of this little boy. Uh, so the only, again, the, the pictures, which for me was the picture was this one. It was his blood spreading all this leaves of this tree that he was wrapping the fruit for his mother. Next, please. Uh, another little girl, seven years old, was killed by this, another missiles attack. And this is the father of this little girl, I saw that, I mean, as a, as a father and having a daughter, I can imagine the pain that he, has going, he was going through. <laughs> uh, her daughter was seven years old when was killed by this Armenian rocket. Next, please. <clears throat> this is another man that, uh, in the same uh, cluster bomb uh, attack, was killed in a village. He was a um, working in the city that the cluster bombs came, but he was from a village not far away. And uh, this was during his funeral. And this is uh, uh, his wife with the 22 days uh, baby that they had. Next, please. I was telling that the women are the main victims of the wars. Even in the war, we see this face of the militaries, the newspapers, magazine, everywhere show us the militaries. But in reality, you know, the, the mother of the soldier, the uh, military, I was listening to her and it was heartbreaking to see that the, the, the one that remain in, uh, after you, they are, they are suffering all their lives. That's why they are victims. And this was I take in the, the cemeteries uh, of where the militaries are buried. Next, please. So when the Azerbaijani militaries finally, they liberated the one fifth of their countries, obviously we the journalists we went in and what I find, I, do, I couldn't believe it. Uh, I couldn't believe because this is not, the, there was seven cities and 460 villages. In all the seven cities and 460 villages, there was no a single home or places that left intact. But they were not destroyed by war. And this is amazing that what I find out as an architect, that none of those homes, maybe 0.1% was destroyed by war, but all of them over 30 years that the Armenian, they were invaded these places. They were dismantling the door, windows, and the roof beams, which are uh, old, most of them done by the 
chestnut by the uh, yeah, chestnut trees or not trees, not yes, uh, or olive trees, olive or, or olive trees. These are very ancient houses, hundreds of hundred years ago they were built. So they were dismantling all these doors and windows and pipelines, everything, and they were sending to Iran. So Iran Islamic Republic, they were sending the merchant coming to here and buy door windows and bring him back to Iran uh, and uh, also uh, everything that was metallic. That's what I find it. Next, please. Recently, I find out that I need to photograph by drone. So I learned a drone. I don't know, I'm sure that you know the drone. It was very fun for me. It takes a lot of time to, to learn. Actually, I lost one, so Mavic uh, Pro 2. Now I bought another one, and now I think that I, this is the second one, which is I'm having problem. I got another one, which is the Mavic, uh, uh, S Air 2, something like this. Anyway, I was photographing the villages and the cemeteries by drone because I find this is the only way I can show what I was telling to you. You see these houses around. These are not destroyed by war. These are all because the beams of the roof, they were taken. The doors and the uh, windows, they were taken and they were sold. But suddenly I saw this shape that was done by the military cars probably. I don't know what you see on it, but I saw like one of those refugee women, which I remembered 30 years ago when they were fleeing and they had their babies in their car. It was like a metaphysic trace of all those millions of the women that suffered and they saw their families killed or they had to flee this. Now it's in the shape of them on the ground. It was very strange when I saw that. I don't know what you think about it, but I mean, this is so strange to find this shape that was done by the military cars to trace this, looking like those women, uh, refugee women that I have seen, millions of them that getting their babies and running. Next, please. Another thing which was very, very difficult for me to accept it is what they did to cemeteries. The Armenian, over 30 years, they destroyed almost every single uh, grave. All the pictures on the grave, they use it, I uh, shot it as a bullet with the bullet or by the hammer. So all of them. And over past years, which I'm photographing, that everything's happened in Karabakh. I have thousands of thousands of those pictures of this, what's happening in the cemetery. Uh, next, please. Or every statue that you can find in Karabakh, they were hammered the faces and the eyes. This is a statue of a very famous singer in the city of Shusha, which is called Bulbul, and it was at his home. There was a lot of museum in these places. Everything's not, nothing left. Everything in the museums in those seven cities, they were taken back, sold maybe. There's only ruins left, only ruins. All the belonging of the houses, everything, they were taken and then they destroyed. Next, please. So this is how I, my, my connection with the people are when I'm photographing. I, I really thanks everybody that taking my picture, that giving, letting me take their pictures. I really humbled uh, in front of them. Uh, this was a story I was doing about the coffee farmers in India. And she was barefoot or walking there. So I was photographing her feet. Next, please. Oh, so when I photograph her, her feet, when I looked up to her saying, thank you, this was her face, and I have these two uh, pictures showing this. Next, please. Now, this is my little secret to you. Uh, if you see this, each of them is 
the clause which I had in one of my assignment or my stories. Uh, that's how I do, that's how I uh, barely have this uh, uh, photographer or reporter uh, pocket with the, the 820 pockets and the, well, I'm usually going in the cities and the villages I mean, or countries which I have to do story. And I look to the people, uh, how they uh, dressed. And then I go to the market and buy the, uh, the clothes. And uh, then I dress like them. I usually at the old times I had my small cameras and I had always an assistant, local assistant, which has all my other gears in case I need my bags and everything, but walking like 15 meters back from me. So I'm inside the population with only one camera, 35 millimeters or 21, depending on the story. And that's how this is the, each one is the different stories that I did. Next, please. So anyway, this is another story. This is all I'm doing is, um, informal visual education uh, because photography it is not only just as a hobby or it for me is a tool to create connection with the people to create a connection with the cultures to tell the stories and change the world believe me the photography has the capacity of changing the world obviously one picture is not going to change the world. The pictures photograph are changing us, are changing humans, are changing our minds, and we are going to change the world. That's, that's why I believe that photography is so important. In, and I have taken this way to, to do it. Anyway, thank you very much for your time. And we have already passed 20 minutes uh, over time, I think. Uh, it was a fantastic to be with you. And now, uh, thank you, Ricardo, and all the FIAP members to organizing it. Thank you, Paul, for being on the on the command of the screenshot, uh, my screen sharing. Um, thank you. Now you're, you're welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very, very, very much, Reza. That has been absolutely fantastic presentation. Uh, I will stop sharing. And Please, as, yes. as we said at the beginning, if anybody has any questions that they want to ask uh, Reza, please send them to us using the chat facility. You um, were receiving, uh, I think, uh, in the middle, you were receiving also a question or not much? Not too much. I'm just looking now. Um, one question that did come in uh, from Seamus here in Ireland is, why do the Armenians hate the Azerbaijanis so much? Well, this is a, a story that happened between, the, uh, let's say, 100 years ago, when the Armenian and the Turks, they were fighting each other, all right? The Armenian and the Turks fighting each other, and they became enemies. Azerbaijanis are Turkic language people. All right. So if I can get an example saying that uh, the German Nazi, they did what they did to the Jewish. All right. We all, everybody knows what they did. Imagine one day the Jewish want take revenge and, but they cannot attack Germans because the German is a big country, but the German is a, uh, has a, uh, uh, I said the huge military, so they cannot attack them. But they said, "Okay, we are going to attack the other German, which is the, living in Switzerland." But they are speaking German, so they take him as a German. Azerbaijani, they are speaking Turkish language. There, uh, in over hundred years, many times the Armenian, the, they had this uh, theory. I want to say that a lot of nation, they had, they, they're saying that we want to create the great Armenia. What is meaning the great Armenia for them is a, in the map of the region, they say that we want to reach between the Caspian Sea 
and the lake of the Van, which is in Turkey. So the reason they started war in 1992 was, okay, now that is the chaos in the Soviet Union, let's take as much as we can. And let's uh, send uh, as much as people that we, we can. They were doing that for over 100 years. Today in Azerbaijan, Iran, Azerbaijan, and the, the North, this Azerbaijan, which is a country, because we have to know that in Azerbaijan, which is a country, there's 10 million Azerbaijani. In Iran, there's 30 million Azerbaijani. It's, uh, they were divided in this way, like the Kurds that were divided. Uh, over 100 years past, the Armenian, every time that they were, they had possibility to come to the Caspian Sea, they tried. And you have a lot of mass graves of the Azerbaijani people, of the stories that they were killed in those attacks. The one in the Khojali, which I told you, the one which is uh, in Azerbaijan Iranian, there is a Jilolog, there is a huge massacres happen of the uh, people, which is still, History doesn't talk about it. In uh, this Azerbaijan here, you have the mass graves of the ten thousands of the people that they were massacred by Armenian in this concept that they want to create the great Armenia. This is, this is what is my understanding and uh, what I learned of the different, different source uh, that what uh, uh, I learned about it. In the past 30 years, uh, Azerbaijan into this country has offered 10 times, more than 10 times to Armenia. Please come and we make peace. You give us some of our lands, we could give you some, and then the population will come back. They didn't accept it. They said, no, no, no. We don't give a single meter of, the, of this land. This land, which I show you, the destruction, the, 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 the graves, that the way that they have done, there were one million people living. Where they where they lived this one million people. They were origin of the place. They were living there, so it was not a just empty land that they said. Oh, this is empty. We take us. Or it is not a land. They said that this was Armenia and we lived here, so it is our land. There was one million Azerbaijani living there, and I think that the time of this kind of the fight and everything is passed. The only way of is a regional peace, opening the borders, let everybody's, like the Europe, you know, the European, German and French, they fight each other uh, in this too big, big war. Now there's no, even no border. They go and come and they, I think that they should accept doing this too. And this is up to Armenia to accept now that uh, uh, if, other people offering me uh, peace, I will accept the peace and uh, I will live in a peace in a, with them. Next, please. Yeah, um, at the beginning of the presentation, Amir Ali Navade Sahala asked a question, which is, what city do you want to see and photograph again? And would you like to go back to Tabriz again so that you could take photographs there? Oh. What city I want to go back in Iran? <clears throat> I mean, this was a, when I was a student, uh, architecture student, I traveled a lot in Iran. I know a lot of places in Iran and many of the places like Mosul or Abyana, the very famous villages now. I was the first photographer that take the pictures of them and make exhibition and make those villages famous, Mosul and Abyana. But, I would thought how I will go back to Iran if this uh, mafia, Islamic mafia, they, they, they were overturned. Uh, then I thought that on foot. And I thought that I will go back on foot. I will go probably from one of the borders and start walking uh, till I can and just uh, photographing people and whatever I can see. So I don't know which border I will enter but it will depend on the border. But I really would like to go back and do all these places on, on, on foot. Okay. Um, Veronica 
Miljojevic from France was asking the question, which is, do you still believe in humanity? More than ever. <laughs> more, more than ever I believe in the humanity. Because uh, uh, I am confident that 500 years or 1,000 years, whatever it is, the, the, uh, the path of the history, uh, will, we will reach what we call the humanity. Uh, what you have seen, what I am showing to you, it's obviously terrible. It is unhuman. It's happening. But by showing this, we could stop them. So, but, but I am so confident. I am so optimistic about the future of humanity. Otherwise, uh, I will not do this. Otherwise, uh, I will just uh, get rid of myself and everybody if I was not... Uh, really believing in the, the, the humanity. The life is beautiful. The humanity is fantastic. The only things which I think that everybody of us, we should do that we are a little more than animals just. We are not here for, uh, on, for only for us. We are here for a community. We are here. I mean, even many of the animals, they do community works like the ants, like uh, zebras, like a lot of like wolves. They have a lot of community works, like uh, bees. So unfortunately, this individualism of the humanity is the envy of the possession is the one that create all these wars and the conflict. Another thing that is create the wars and conflict, and I think that this is also is going to change, is this stupid people that always think that my God is better than your God. You know, the religion, when they fight each other, the reason is that because my God is better than your God. My understanding of my, both of them, they're reading the same book. They say that God, God sent messengers and the prophets or whoever. But in the meantime, they're fighting each other in the name of the God. So these are the things, the God and the oil are the two vectors of most of the wars in the uh, humanity. So we have to find a way to solve these two problems. And then, then there will be no war. Sandumi Fernando, who is from Sri Lanka, asked the question, what are the major obstacles that you came across during your wonderful journey? The major obstacles are more in the Paris and New York and London or the capitals when the newspapers and magazine are. Uh, the major obstacles are when you have a story and you have been on the field for years or months, like this one, like the one which I have been photographing for one year now. When you go back there, you find that nobody wants to publish it, that no, for different reason. Like my story about this, what's happened in Armenia, I mean, all of you, you have... Uh, heard and seen pictures from other side. Even I heard that the Rai TV, they made a film from the other side, Armenian, which I could show professionally that it's one of the wrongest uh, works which I have seen. This uh, Rai TV's uh, journalist, she made a terrible job. She's, and I could show it. I mean, I'm telling this here, everybody knows. And, uh, legally, I can show that she's wrong. So when I go back to the, um, it's not only here, it has been uh, for many other stories. Uh, the obstacles are getting people that uh, have the media and they want to publish it. So it's becoming more and more difficult. But fortunately, we have social media and the social media at least is becoming, replacing those media uh, just to tell you about the media, 95% of French media, 95% is owned by eight people. And France is one of the uh, countries that has uh, the, the, the incredible numbers of the newspapers, magazines, TVs, and shows and everything. 
and France is the uh, birthplace of the human rights, of the freedom of speech, eight billionaire holding 95% of the French media. How do you want they became independent? How do you want them uh, to tell the truth? They're all somehow, all this millionaire, billionaire, they are all related to one of those stories, either to God or to oil or to other stories. So that's why our media is a main problem now. The main, main, main obstacle is the media now. Hey, uh, yep. So Amir Badrasimi asks, have you been attacked in your photographs of war zones and how did you adapt to the situation? How, how sorry you say again? Have you been attacked? Whenever attacked. You, yes. Have you personally been attacked? A hundred times. A hundred <laughs> times. Uh, I have put in prison for three years in Iran for my photograph. I have been tortured for five months in a small cell. Then I exile, living in exile. And uh, more than a hundred times uh, uh, in the different places, I thought that this is the last moment of my life. I close my eyes and saying that goodbye, Reza. Uh, I have been wounded a couple of times, uh, attacked by the, sometimes by demonstrator, sometimes by the riot police. But I mean, this is all part of the risk of the job that you, you, you want to say, you want to show. When you decided that the truth is going to be your um, uh, main line of the, what you want to do, then you may get attacked, you may get smear campaign. Uh, almost I have been named uh, uh, all kind of the, how you say it, uh, the, when someone to uh, the uh, idealist, no, sorry, the, the different name, the communist, Marxist, Islamist, uh, whatever. Uh, everybody is seeing that in his own way, but you keep going, you keep moving. Okay. We have, saying, um, we have a saying in Paris, in, in, in many countries, uh, that the caravans pass, but the dogs uh, bark. <laughs> Actually, one of the final questions, uh, which comes from Mehrnoush from Iran, and he says, What is your opinion about citizen journalism? And is it possible? with the advent of citizen journalism, that the photographer's role could become less and less? Well, I think the Mehrnush is the name of a girl. Oh, sorry, okay. <laughs> Apologies to Mehrnush. No problem, no problem. Uh, well, just to let you know that uh, what you have seen, what I show you, it was half of my works. My other half works in the past 40 years was trainings. Trainings, refugee people, trainings, women, training the local people to become journalists, to become what is now called citizen journalism. This is the future. It is not even future, it is now. The story that we are getting from Ispahan, the, the riots and the police which are shooting people, there's no professional photographer. There's maybe one or two which are immediately attacked by them. Everything is done by citizen journalism. As a matter of fact, uh, the, the very, very first in the history uh, of the works by citizen journalism was in 2009 in a demonstration in Iran when the police, they shot a girl which was called Neda in three meters and she died on the on the spot like three two minutes after and one man uh, filmed this with his phone this was shown in all the tvs in the world and became the the whole story became known to the world there is even a hbo documentary about it this is the first citizen journalism stories but saying this, the photographer's role, they are not going to diminish. 
uh, in the same way that uh, 100 years ago, uh, there were only few people that they had access to the pen. The writers, the poets, the accountants, the administration people, they were the only people that they have a pen in their pockets. Then 100 or 200 years ago, they were invention of those point pens, big or others. Now nice. everybody, everybody has this pen in the pocket. But having pen in the pocket, it didn't make more Shakespeare's. It didn't make more Victor Hugo's. It didn't make for John Faulkner or any other poet, you know. This is a tool. The photography, as I mentioned in the beginning, we are the people that we are telling the stories of our civilization and daily life of our civilization with images. So it is, it is not just taking a picture. Taking picture is different than doing photography. You know, there is a one million brush for painting sold every day in the world. I find that through Google, one million. Every day, one million brush of painting by. But look back, how many Van Gogh we had? How many Picasso, how many Dali we had in over 100 years with all those brushes that is sold? So photography and photographer is like a poet. You can even study literature for years and years. You can read all the poetry books, but you may not become a poet yourself. So that's why I think that it's two different things. Citizen journalism is fantastic. It's future. It's going to show the news much what's happening in the way happening. But if you have a photographer with a photographer eye, it may get different pictures from the same scene, which will remain also in a different way. Thank you. Thank you, Reza. I think we have come to the end of all of the questions. Fantastic. So on behalf of everybody uh, who has been here today, I would just like to say a very, very big thanks. We had an audience, we have guests here uh, from the West Coast of the States, from Chile, from Argentina, from the Caribbean, Ireland and the UK and different parts of Europe, even Israel, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, people from all over the world That's have it. seen and witnessed your fantastic witness to humanity. And on behalf of all of us who have been here, we just say a very, very, very big thank you. It's been absolutely brilliant. Many, many thanks for joining us and for sharing your photography and your experiences. So thank, thank you very you. much. I, <laughs> I thanks everybody. And, uh, um, my friend uh, Ricardo, you and everybody else that were on the board of the FIAB for fantastic works that you're doing. And uh, I really hope that we could keep uh, uh, this connection uh, or different way uh, with the FIAB uh, photographers. Definitely. Many thanks. I know before we go, I know Ricardo has some words he wants to say. So I give the floor to you, Ricardo. Absolutely. Thanks, Paul. So congratulations, dear Reza. I can say without any doubt that uh, today we have witnessed a great lesson in photography and by one of the greatest photographers of our time. Thank any you. further words would be useless. <laughs> I just hope that the project that we both have in mind for the near future can soon take shape so that we can offer to the FIAP authors the opportunity to get to know you better and benefit from your verbal advice. Once again, thank you, dear Reza, for your presence and congratulations for your incredible presentation. And remember that I'm still waiting you and your brother Manuch in Tuscany. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so well, well, dear friends, thank you again for your uh, participation. Looking forward to meeting you all soon on Sunday, 18 December, for another incredible event. Okay. Yes, this time to conclude this second year of the Fiat Photo Academy activities, we have invited a world famous master, 
who, like Reza, I'm sure, does not need to be presented. Art worth. Oh, yes, of course. Yes, as a, another of the greatest photographer of all time. So it's a special event not be, to be missed. So Reza, Manushi, you are invited as always. And I hope to see you. Very good. In the occasion. So thank you very much. If you got any feedback of the people that listening, I would love to, if you could share with me. So it's I, yes, yes, I will indeed. I can, I can take the chat and send it to you afterwards. Fantastic. By, by email. Oh. Absolutely no problem. Thank so, you very much. And uh, I just wanted to say something. Please. First of all, thank you. Grazie, Ricardo. Thank you, Pia, for giving us the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I'm so proud to have such a brother. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> okay, see you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.